Today I am going to go on at some length about Kennedy's inaugural. Does everyone have a copy of that? And as your analysis tells you, in JFK's inaugural, one of the ways in which the speech is um, created stylistically is through antithesis and parallelism. And this fits in wonderfully well with phrases that are alliterative. Now, you can overdo it, but I think in this speech, it's not really overdone. But Kennedy, hatless, which was new for an inaugurated president. Presidents before had always worn top hats of some kind at inauguration. Kennedy did not. Kennedy hatless delivered this. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. So what's going on in just that clause? Not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. Yes, he is uniting everyone. First of all, you say we're not, we're not championing one particular party. We're celebrating freedom. In terms of style, what is going on? Not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. Yeah, a kind of antithesis. It's, antithesis and parallelism are pretty close. And here you could say uh, a victory of party is somewhat antithetical to a celebration of freedom, perhaps not a true opposite. but. Yes, there's parallelism in the structure. Symbolizing an end as well as a beginning. An end of what? The yeah, the election, the previous administration. He doesn't say it, but the previous administration was Republican. But So he wants part, part of the theme of this speech is that it is a new beginning. So this symbolizing an end as well as a beginning. Signifying, now notice that, symbolizing and signifying renewal as well as change. So just look at that structure for a second. Symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, comma, signifying, and there's symbolizing and signifying renewal as well as change. So an end as well as a beginning, renewal. Renewal suggests what? Discontinuity or continuity of some kind. Continuity of some kind, yes, as well as change. When you listen to something that's this patterned for a long period of time, it will get monotonous. And one of the very remarkable things about this is that it's highly patterned, but it's also varied in its patterning. The sentence length is varied. The use of alliteration is varied. The antitheses are varied. It's really... It's, and it's done with language that word for word is relatively simple. Did you have to look up any word reading this speech? No. This is not, this is not a speech that has hard terms in it at all. To our sister republics south of the border. Nice phrase. Why are they sister republics? Sounds good. Why might they be called sister republics? Many have constitutions based on the US. That's part of it, yes. And also, they're in the same hemisphere. And we talked earlier about the Monroe Doctrine, where the United States felt a responsibility for maintaining a certain degree of democracy. Now you can say the United States violated that in many ways through economic imperialism and other forms of control. But Kennedy is trying to make a new start with the sister republic south of the border. We offer a special pledge. sister. Republics south of the border, we offer a special pledge. He's been talking about pledges. This is a special one now. To convert our good words into good deeds in a new alliance for progress. And he actually, the Kennedy administration, had a program called the Alliance for Progress, which was a way to try to help countries in South America to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. But let this peaceful, revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. We've got alliteration of S, of G, of F, of C, and of P, all within five lines. Used sparingly, let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas 
and let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. Is that what happened completely? No. Cuba, of course, became strongly aligned with the Soviet Union. To that world assembly of sovereign states, the United Nations, our last best hope. Where does that phrase come from? What president had used that phrase, our last best hope? Is that Lincoln? Yes, it's Lincoln's phrase. The phrase had been used by other writers in other contexts before Lincoln, but it's a phrase that people closely studying American political rhetoric would identify with Lincoln. The United Nations, our last best hope. Now that's interesting. He's not calling the United States the last best hope, which is in essence what Lincoln did. Now the last best hope is the United Nations. The world has changed. In an age where the instruments of war have far outpaced the instruments of peace, we renew our pledge of support to prevent it from becoming merely a forum for invective. In other words, the accusation of the United Nations long has been that it is simply a debating society, that it doesn't do anything. To prevent it from becoming merely a form for invective, to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak, and to enlarge the area in which its writ may run. Finally, to those nations who would make themselves our adversary. I love that phrase. Why doesn't he say, finally, to our adversaries? Why doesn't he just say, finally, to our enemies? Or why doesn't he say, finally, to our sworn enemies? The implication is that it's preordained. It's yes. their decision. And it's, therefore, yes. they can change their decision. Yes, yes. It's a very clever form of phrasing, really. Finally, to those nations that would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge not come pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace before the dark powers of destruction unleashed by science engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction.